Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this live webinar on Lithuania, the gateway to fintech in Europe. Very pleased to, uh, to have two thought leaders uh, on the fintech ecosystem and landscape uh, here with me this evening. So first up, I've got uh, Marius Jurgilis from the Bank of Lithuania, who's a board member there at the bank. And I also have uh, Dominika Stankevicius, who's a senior investment advisor for fintech at Invest Lithuania. The format for this evening is going to be uh, running through a series of questions. We're going to first of all jump into uh, to Europe. Uh, we, we'll have a, a couple of questions on Europe. We'll then move into Lithuania and ask uh, some specific questions on Lithuania that are preset. So this is not the not the moment for you to uh, to get in on the action and ask some questions yourselves. However, that will come uh, a little bit a uh, little bit later on. Uh, we'll also ask a couple of questions that have come up from the uh, the live landing page when uh, when you registered for this webinar. Uh, and then we'll move into the, the live Q&A when you've got a chance to actually uh, ask some of the questions in the comments section uh, at the bottom of the page. And uh, following that, we'll have a short wrap up uh, and, uh, and see where we, where we go from there. So um, let's begin. Thanks very much for joining us. If you're on the, uh, the other side of the pond or, or here in Europe, I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of, uh, of interesting material for you to, uh, to listen into uh, this evening. Great, let's, uh, let's start off then with, with Europe uh, and let's sort of set the context in terms of you know, how has the fintech landscape changed in Europe in the past couple of years? Well, it's a very broad question to answer, but first of all, very, very pleased to be here. And if I could just um, be not very vague, but uh, very focused on what Europe is doing in, in the space of fintech, uh, it doesn't take much. People just look at what is defined by European Commission FinTech Action Plan. And the fact that European Commission, which is like the governing body in the European Union, uh, has a document which says, we have a FinTech Action Plan, says much. Um, European Commissioner for Financial Services set out a plan that Europe should adopt financial technology for the purpose of making our financial industry more innovative. Uh, if I have to put it in the context of other countries, um, we do not have, Europe does not still have uh, the Googles, Amazons, Baidus, and WeChats, and that's something that we really envy. And uh, the politicians uh, are making everything possible to make sure that such giants appear in European Union. So far, we have a very vibrant uh, community, community which is challenging the incumbents, and uh, it is worth noticing that Europe is dominated by bank-provided financial services. So those who are willing and thinking that they should disrupt it, this is the main battleground that they should be looking at. Europe is dominated by banks, by bank credit, by bank uh, intermediation, and uh, anything that uh, would make this market more competitive, it would be wel welcome. Super, thank you. And then if we you know, sort of pick up on that and, and think especially about uh, US fintechs, um, you know, why, why should companies look into Europe? Why should we, why should we consider Europe? Sure, so Europe, I think, is a really interesting market, which has 28 countries uh, with uh, more than 512 million customers. 23 million uh, SMEs uh, are established in Europe, and we have more than 7,000 uh, banks and credit unions. So I think the, the amount of, of uh, potential clients for the, uh, for the fintechs is, is, is really big here. What is more, the, the market is harmonized, which means that companies established in one country can actually act in the, in the whole European market, uh, depending on the licenses, of course. But uh, this is a really attractive uh, value proposition for, for fintechs. What is more, I would say that uh, Europe has a really young uh, and uh, tech-savvy uh, population, which attracts a lot of companies to start their innovative solutions here in, in Europe. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And then if we, if we you know, we've been asking about uh, looking outside in into uh, to Europe, um, Maris, you've got quite a lot of experience, you know, comparing the other uh, fintech mm -hmm. ecosystems in other countries or, or other continents. How does this compare to to Asia, to the US, and, and others? So Dominic has already touched on that a, a little bit. Um, you know, Europe is um, quite a few countries. So someone the outsider, or, you know, in the financial services would think, that, you know, in a, such a highly regulated industry like financial services, having twenty eight plus something jurisdictions that you have to comply with could be very difficult, specifically for someone who is just entering this market. But actually the fact that we have 
the regulatory system which makes financial service provision across borders in the European Union quite easy, and not, you know, quite easy, it's not you know, straightforward, that's the reason why we need fintechs to make it even more easier, uh, is something that uh, really should uh, attract uh, those who are willing to provide financial services in the European Union. Um, if I would compare to some other countries, um, uh, I would say that financial technology companies in the European Union are focusing on the B2C element more than just B2B element and you know, trying to be add-ons to, to the banking sector. This is, as I, I was saying in my previous comment, they're trying to disrupt this final mile of pro providing actual financial services <coughs> and not you know, doing the, uh, the back office uh, provision of um, regulatory elements in the banking sector more efficient. So the defining difference for me is uh, if some other countries, fintech firms are, you know, like bolt-ons, add-ons to better banking, in Europe, fintechs are providing financial services to the consumer. Super, thank you. And are there any other sort of, um, sort of big misconceptions, especially from the US looking into Europe, about, you know, fintech in, in Europe? Um, there might be a feeling that... Um, Europe is backwards, you know, we are behind. Um, some of that is true, and in some areas we are behind. And uh, again, you know, we, we don't have the big national, supranational champions that, you know, we would really cherish. But what we have, we have the desire to really change the status quo, and we have a desire to implement regulatory elements. And as a regulator, I could, you know, say, the fact that European Union clamped down on interchange fees, for example, really changed the, the payment card business uh, in European Union. The fact that we forced banks to open up, open up their data that they have on the consumers so that third parties can utilize their service and make banks a little bit like uh, you know, the pipelines. Uh, that is introducing new business models, uh, possibilities for uh, completely new financial services that have not been around to be introduced. So, the misconception could be there that Europe is behind, but the fact that we're a little bit behind is making us move forward. And the final one that I'm really proud of is that we in Europe are really pushing with a so-called instant payments uh, initiative so that, you know, Portugal to Germany payments would fly in, in seconds, the final settlement, and again, replacing <coughs> cash, introducing new business models. Super, super. Thanks for, thanks for sharing those. And talking more on the, on the preconceptions, you've talked a little bit about the opportunities. What would be then the challenges in, in looking at uh, fintech in, in, in Europe? Sure. So I believe that this answers the question why we do not have so many unicorns in Europe uh, compared to, to US is that uh, we have a big market which has 28 countries, which is uh, one of the value propositions that we've mentioned before. But it's also a challenge because there's 28 countries with different languages, different cultures, different geographies and, and, and mindsets. So we know scaling for Europe is, is a bit harder than scaling for the US. But that's why the government is doing a lot to, to help companies enter one country and then scale throughout uh, Europe. What is even more, uh, if, we, if we look at the venture capital field, it's not as developed as, as the one in the Silicon Valley, for example, or, or in Israel but we see a lot of uh, new interesting venture capital firms arising. And last but not least is, is, is Brexit uncertainties. We see uh, a lot of our clients and, and investors are really concerned about what's going to happen. And some of them are actually postponing their plans uh, to establish in Europe to see what's, what's going to happen in, uh, the, at the end of this year. Okay, great. Thanks. Some really ni nice, uh, nice outlines there as well. Maris, some, some further comments on, on yeah, those topics? Just, again, I just wanted to add uh, from the regulatory perspective, something which is, I think, really important is uh, the commitment of the European Union to build so-called capital market union, which in human language means that if you are a, a broker, dealer, a trading platform, a bank, right, providing services from Germany to France, from France to Italy, from Lithuania to Estonia, <clears throat> should be provided freely, right? It's not there yet, but there's a clear commitment to create such a framework, right? So yes, 28 countries, different languages, but you know, we really value in Europe diversity, and that's also maybe providing some kind of diversification from you know, not a monoline business model that everyone adopts and you know, just scales across Europe. And, you know, it's susceptible to you know, being competed away from Chinese 
right? Sure. Uh, and here we have uh, some niche developments and, you know, in asset management uh, from Luxembourg. Uh, we have payments initiatives uh, from, uh, from the Baltics. We have, uh, you know, Crypto Valley in, well, so far Europe, or some kind of Europe from Swiss. So there are multiple things happening in the fintech space uh, which uh, create this diversity. And what I hear from you as well is, you know, a lot of change is still, is still coming and, uh, and on the way as well. Um, yeah, changes, you know, are complicated things when it comes to financial markets because it means uh, adoption to new regulatory stance and things like that. Um, if I could just, you know, maybe, which is in the headlines right now, you know, is the crypto assets. Uh, Europe is really taking that subject really seriously. And um, <clears throat> if I should say that next year we should expect something, that's in that space. Okay. Super. Thanks for the, uh, the insights there as well. Okay, so that brings us to the, uh, the, the, the end of the, the first sort of section where we talk about Europe and, and put this uh, whole discussion into, uh, into context. Let's move into to Lithuania, uh, where we are today. And, uh, you know, let's start off with, you know, a little bit on the background. How did Lithuania, why did Lithuania choose fintech as a strategic priority for the country? Right. So I guess it's worth uh, pointing out that uh, this initiative for fintech in Lithuania has been adopted by the government, right? All our uh, public institutions like the regulator, Ministry of Finance, Invest Lithuania, we are facilitating that. And what is the underlying reason? I would say there are three main ones. The first one is that we want more competition in our domestic financial market. I said Europe is dominated by banks, but in a country called Lithuania, we have a super concentrated financial market with just a few market players having very big dominant positions in main financial service uh, verticals. So competition, right? So we want more entry, more competition. The second one is uh, we want innovative financial services to be developed and provided to our domestic consumers, businesses, and the likes. And the third one is uh, Lithuania has been attracting really successfully so-called shared service centers, which are serving the global banking community. And this is really a fertile ground for this talent pool to be taken to the next level. And that is ne next level from a, or now a macroeconomic perspective is higher added value jobs. Super, super. I think that's, uh, that's something that I've definitely personally seen, this whole shift and moving up the value chain away from sort of the, some of the initial um, things that people were doing in the shared service and centres and now very much high end uh, on, the, on the finance, tax, accounting and so on. And this, is, this is really encouraging to see. Uh, so, uh, Dominicus, you know, a quick, quick, uh, quick um, some, some views for our American viewers, especially here on, you know, why would fintech companies choose Lithuania? Sure. So I'm, I'm going to speak on, on, on behalf of, of the clients from, from the U.S. that are coming here. So I would say that the, the first and uh, the most important thing is the regulator's approach to the financial market. The, the things that Mars have mentioned about, uh, you know, creating the uh, challengers, creating the, the ones who want to innovate, uh, attracting the transparent companies who wants to disrupt uh, the market is, is the key priority. Uh, the Bank of Lithuania is also running a specific retail payment in infrastructure, which helps companies to connect directly through to SEPA and make payments in euros, which uh, is one of the most competitive uh, pro value propositions, I think, in Europe. Uh, the third thing is, is the talent pool. As Maris mentioned, we have uh, Barclays, uh, Danske Bank, uh, Western Union, uh, uh, NASDAQ, and other financial giants who came here in, I would say, 2010, 2015, and now we have a, a pool of specialists who worked in, in this financial se service sector for about five to seven years. Now, <coughs> part of them are starting to look for more impactful, more global, more niche jobs where they can feel the, the result of their work immediately. And this is why a lot of companies uh, are, are scaling their offices here in Lithuania to support their European uh, activities from uh, Vilnius. And the fourth, uh, last but not least, is the, our growing fintech community. We see that uh, our fintech in event that we're going to have at the end of uh, November, uh, we're going to share the details in the follow-up email, 
uh, is actually attracting a lot of uh, you know people from from all of the, all over the world. And I was extremely happy to see last year that the Chinese company was doing a deal with the U.S. company at the, at the conference. And this growing ecosystem and the, and the interest from the market, from the universities, uh, you know, from, from the government is, is really helping uh, to grow this uh, ecosystem. And that's why the companies are coming here. Super. And I think, you know, again, this ambitious talent, this uh, ambitious workforce with a hunger uh, is a, you know, really, uh, really strong signal, really, uh, really great to see in, in action as well. Yeah. Maybe just to, to add on, 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 on that, we see that a lot of companies find this can-do attitude. We're a small country which only has 3 million uh, people here. So we gained our independence uh, about 30 years ago and uh, we want to prove to the world that we can deliver the global uh, solutions uh, for the global challenges and that's, that's uh, what uh, the people really like. Fantastic, great, it's great to hear. Maris, some, some further more, comments? More on, on this uh, can-do attitude, you know, it really has a very pragmatic explanation. As I said, Europe is diverse and in the context of a previous financial crisis, uh, still some countries uh, have issues in the banking industry, you know, the legacy assets, the, the level of non-performing loans in some of the sovereign countries. And uh, that really uh, introduces diversity in the way regulators embrace this new industry financial technology. What I'm trying to say, there is again a reason why same regulatory environment same rules, uh, same, I think, regulators have different approaches in different European countries. <coughs> the reason why in Europe, uh, in, in Lithuania, we have such a welcoming approach to fintech is because we want more competition. We don't have uh, domestic giants that we want to protect, right? Whereas in other bigger European countries, they are solving the issue of overcapacity in the banking industry. You know, the mergers, some of them unsuccessful due to political reasons and, uh, you know, trying to clean up the system. Here we have a very specific goal, making our sector more competitive and the more competition, the more challenges, the better. Super. And you touched on a little bit there around, um, uh, you know, the sort of the government strategic initiatives to, to really promote fintech as well. And I think for a lot of people, they would be almost surprised to hear that the regulator is being so proactive and doing such good things. What, what's been sort of the key success factor or the secret source that, that's making this happen from the regulator side? Uh, I wouldn't discount these uh, soft elements as being probably the, uh, the core, at the core of this success collaboration between uh, public institutions because we really had this unifying goal at, across all the public institutions. Um, going to the concrete level, Dominique has already alluded to that, um, you know, this infrastructure solution that we decided as a Bank of Lithuania to introduce, and maybe for the US viewers I can explain it using the analogy, right? Uh, think of yourself being a Venmo or Stripe equivalent and uh, you know, having to find a bank which is banking you. In Europe, it's even more complicated because you know, banks really want to protect the turf. So in Lithuania, we created a solution where you can cut out the middleman. You know, we provide access to the equivalent of Fedwire without having a need to have bank as your partner. So all of a sudden, the game is completely changed. You are at equal footing. You don't need a banking license. You can be. You have to be regulated. A regulatory status that you know we have in Europe, either the payment institution or electronic money institution, which is just a form of e-wallet. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> you're plugged into electricity, and off you go, innovate, and provide financial services. And you, and you talk there about sort of the, the, the interconnection and the you know the being being plugged into the uh, to the wider system. Um, we've talked about Lithuania being a small but ambitious country. Um, how well connected are we in Lithuania? What other kind of cooperation do we have with, with, with other hubs? Mm -hmm. So starting from, from the US, we're working specifically with the venture capital firms because we see that they have a lot of companies in their portfolios and they can specifically direct us to the ones who are looking for the European ex expansion. So that is, that is one. Uh, the second thing is we're working with the associations in the US. Uh, we see that their members are constantly asking about what other markets can we investigate if, if they already uh, feel that they are covered the U.S. market. 
In the UK, we're mainly working with the associations as well. So, uh, for example, the Electronic Money Association from the UK has a, a branch here that helps their members to discover opportunities here. We're working with Innovate Finance uh, and the Electronic Payments Association as, as well. If we look into Israel, I would say we're mainly uh, working with the venture capital there. Uh, with the Singapore, we have uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Singapore FinTech Association and they're helping their companies to come to Europe and we're actually helping companies from Europe to, to go to Singapore. And with China, we're, we're still trying to find the, the best uh, ways to, to enter the market, and, but we still see a lot of interest from, from there as, as, as well. And maybe it's worthwhile to mention that a lot of uh, countries uh, from Europe are looking into Lithuania uh, in order to collaborate, to learn from the central bank and to learn from others uh, on how to create the, the Finta hub in, in the region. Sounds like a really exciting time to be, you know, building global alliances, partnerships, and um, and cooperation. Yeah. Anything else to, to add on uh, on that side, Maris? Again, from a regulatory perspective, you know, that's the only thing I can contribute to this conversation mm. is that we, as regulators, we are completely plugged in into the financial innovation global network. Uh, Dominicus already said, ranging from Southeast Asia to United States to South Africa, we are. You know, building relationships with regulators to make sure that we have a, a trustful relationship, we understand each other's uh, risk appetite, and uh, we can share information because we have to admit, fintech is global. If it is global, it is very important to facilitate the development of those companies who from day zero want to be global businesses. That is the reason why Lithuania and Bank of Lithuania is a member of so-called Global Financial Innovators Network, which is led by the Financial Conduct Authority uh, in UK, which enables innovative businesses to test their solutions if they fall in so-called gray zone from a regulatory perspective before they go live. So we are in the middle right now of in the process of evaluating five potential applicants who are willing, for example, to test the solution which will introduce and make it easier to passport your so-called KYC data. So that if a client is identified in Singapore, it is already being, that data could be used to process transactions and identify the client in Europe. For that, very small and nuanced details in, in legal space have to be aligned, mm -hmm. and we talk <clears throat> in a regulator's forum, how should we facilitate that? I think that's a fantastic example, and uh, I think it's also really, really encouraging to see and hear how as the regulator, you're not only building the networks and, and the space within Lithuania, but also proactively with, uh, with other countries and other ecosystems there, and this is, uh, this is really encouraging. Yeah, it, is, it, is, it is essential, because um, if we don't do that, um, the business will, will hit the boundary. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, you asked uh, what are the, the key defining moments. I said financial infrastructure that we created, uh, which enables to be plugged in, uh, right? The second one was the ability to onboard clients remotely. Okay, right now this is a, taken as given, but that again was this changing the definition of the size of a market, where all of a sudden you're not only serving the customer across the street right, who has to walk into your brick and mortar store. No, you are really able to tap into this growing affluent European community and provide to them uh, financial services and gain from the scale which uh, European Union provides. And I think exactly as you said again there, you know, fintech is a global business, so people want that global interconnectedness when they're, when they're doing business with, uh, with And fintech. you can you can reach global scale mm -hmm. by being local, living in a nice and beautiful city of Vilnius, wearing shorts and mm -hmm. uh, benefiting from global climate, uh, global uh, warming. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, definitely enjoying the, uh, the, the global interconnectedness. That's, uh, that's, that's definitely a, a positive factor of, uh, of being in Vilnius, for sure. Super. So I think that brings us to the, to the end of the second part, where we have a little bit of a deeper dive into, uh, into Lithuania. Uh, we also have two questions that were uh, uh, registered uh, before, the, uh, before this webinar began. Uh, so we have, um, we have two here. So um, any other good examples of fintech collaboration with EU banks? Yeah. You'd like so to take that? What we see from, from the fintech sector is actually that a lot of uh, companies are looking for partners. It's a, it's a sector where there's a lot of, the supply chain is really long and you need to have partners if you're working in the fintech business. 
So what we see is that a lot of uh, banks are now starting their innovation centers. So for example, Barclays had their uh, rise here in, in Vilnius. Uh, SEB has uh, one innovation center here as well. Uh, Swedbank is, is just planning to have one as, as well. So we see that banks are moving into this sector. The key thing here is the PSD2 regulation. So basically it allows companies to tap into the, the data uh, that the banks have and uh, allow to build solutions on top of the back end of, of the bank. And this will open, I think, a new uh, possibilities for a lot of companies uh, in, in Europe and, and from, from abroad. This is a new field, I would mm -hmm. say. So we do not have too many examples, but we have uh, examples where uh, the bank in, uh, onboarded their loyalty solution startup uh, to use their data and to allow companies uh, to tap in, into that field. We also have pre-order solutions where the banks can allow uh, using their card to, to pre-order and pay immediately uh, through, through the banking app. And we also see that a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of uh, fintechs are providing their back-end solutions for, for the banks to connect to other markets or to you know, do AML, KYC, and, and, and other uh, solutions. Great. So uh, some really good examples already and with PSD2 coming gonna, uh, even more yeah. uh, so sort of watch this space and uh, and see what uh, what happens from uh, from here yeah. okay and then uh, the other question that came in was i mean it's june already we're, we're already getting to sort of the end of the first half of the year uh, time's flying as, as usual um has, has the situation changed dramatically since the beginning of the year you know how does the current situation look compared to uh, sort of at the start of 2019 Any Probably there was some context in, in this question, which is not really apparent. Mm -hmm. I would say what, what we see uh, is uh, that the maturity of the uh, ecosystem is really ratcheting up. Okay. Uh, we see some of the so-called uh, uh, really kind of small firms uh, either dropping out and uh, the bigger ones uh, coming in. So that is uh, something which I, I would mm -hmm. see. But uh, maybe, Dominika, so, you, know, you see the flow much more better than I do. Sure. So what we see is actually that uh, payment sector is, uh, is not growing as fast uh, as it used to be. Uh, we see more niche products in the lending and wealth tech, especially, because wealth tech is uh, one of the priority fields here in Lithuania and I think throughout the Eastern Europe. SME lending is growing quite fast uh, as well. We have uh, quite a few foreign companies established here providing their capital for the SMEs here. And payments, yeah, I would say that they're changing uh, quite, quite fast. Okay. Actually, there's one thing that uh, I think it's really worth mentioning is that if uh, before, uh, in the previous year, we had uh, somewhat of a hype in the so-called ICO uh, market and uh, crypto assets. What we see right now is that market really maturing and making us as a regulator really interested in that subject. Uh, why is that? Um, we see that as a possibility to jumpstart almost dead capital market and ability to introduce liquidity into this uh, ecosystem. That is the reason why Bank of Lithuania is in the middle of consultation right now on so-called security token offerings, where we collaborated, and that's another level of collaboration, not the bank, with uh, uh, financial capital market industry, uh, more specifically NASDAQ, who really feel a threat to be excluded from capital markets uh, if everything moves on uh, distributed ledger issuance. How you should raise capital if you want to do that in a regulated way but utilizing distributed ledger technology. So Bank of Lithuania is providing the guidance, and if uh, someone thinks that we are doing a mistake, uh, they, are th they are encouraged, including across the globe, to tell us uh, how to do it better. So open to ideas, and uh, you know, the, the, the STO space is, uh, is maturing, and uh, we'll hear some, uh, some more, more good we, things coming out of this soon. Yes, uh, we are very much open, uh, openness uh, in uh, innovation as well as open banking. Uh, we really want to make sure that uh, this uh, three-letter word PSD2, which is introducing ability to tap into the data sitting at the banks, is a success. For that, we're really watching the market, making sure that incumbents do not introduce some technological hurdles, uh, some diverse standards, uh, and it's very difficult to integrate and uh, to utilize that. 
and uh, we'll be watching and reacting if we have to. Okay, super. And uh, you know, I think it's it's been pretty pretty broadly in the in the press uh, today in the last few days about Facebook having their own plans to launch the the Libra, uh, their own currency. Um, we have a thank you very much. We have a, a question from uh, Polis Tarbunas, uh, and he's written in and he's saying, you know, what do you think about Facebook's plans? Uh, are there any Im uh, um, opportunities here for the for the Lithuanian fintech community and uh, risks for the central bank? So I think, Maris, it would be interesting yeah. to hear your thoughts on the, on the risk side. Mm. And uh, Dominikus, if you have any thoughts on the uh, opportunities as well, that would be great. Well, let's start with the, the risks and, uh, and set, the scene, uh, set the scene there. At the risk of uh, making a joke, uh, you know, everyone should have expected it. Everyone was talking about that behind the scenes, uh, you know, when, when they're going to do that. But once they did it, or not, not, they haven't done it, right? They just announced it or, or leaked it. The white paper, yeah. So. Yeah, the white, the, the white paper is still kind of, yes. I haven't seen uh, Financial Times do, an, uh, do nine articles in six hours on one subject. Wow. Yes, wow. from all different angles. Risks, technology, mm -hmm. is it a uh, DLT or oh, it's not? What kind of DLT is that? What impact will it have? Coming from a central bank and things like that. Now, seriously? Uh, I think the subject of crypto assets or cryptocurrencies will be the defining moment for the next year. Uh, the central banking community are deeply diving into the subject, evaluating the risks. We see the benefits, of course, but uh, I think that this subject will not escape regulatory sphere. It is too close to the core of the economy, to political economy, so that uh, the issuance of money the medium of exchange will be diverted to the private sector, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Will we allow someone else to do that on our behalf in a regulated way? That is something that I think we should be debating. So I fully subscribe to Mark Carney's words that uh, you know, we central bankers, we should, op should be open. We are open, but we are watching. Okay, good clear message uh, on that side as well. Thank you. And Opportunities, you know, what are the new opportunities then that come from, from Facebook being sure. here? So I think the key question is why they are doing this. Uh, they have a global outreach to customers from basically all over, all, all over the world. And they want to help people move money between themselves, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, payments easier. So we see that market and the technology firms are moving into fee this field because they think they can do it better than the banks, than the incumbents, right? And this is a signal for the incumbents. And this is the signal for, for the government that they have to do something better. They have to create global ecosystems that uh, would uh, allow people to move money quite easily. Of course, there is a question about the KYC, how you're going to do it. But Facebook, remind, I will remind you that Facebook has a lot of data about you. So they can use that data wisely and uh, do the KYC quite, quite easily on you. But I think this is a, a time when we can actually ask ourselves uh, how can we make the system and money movement between different countries, different cultures easier, more frictionless, uh, you know, with less, uh, less of the capital needed and payments and fees and et cetera. Super. I think one, one of the other things that stood out for me was the, uh, the, the clear communication, communication message around social inclusion and Facebook wanting to reach out to you know, the billions of people who are still unbanked. Um, maybe just to reflect back as well on, on, on what kind of impact we've had in Lithuania in terms of social inclusion through uh, promoting the fintech uh, ecosystem. Hmm. Any, any thoughts on, on that side? Um, it might be a surprise to hear that 20% of uh, Lithuanian consumers are financially excluded by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the usual metric is, do you hold a bank account? But do you use it? So 20% of respondents in Lithuanian bank uh, survey say that they have a bank account, but they choose not to use it because they, the fees that they, they, they are incurring, they find it too expensive and they resort to cash. Of course, there are multiple reasons why people answer that question that way. You know, uh, shadow economy, uh, trying to avoid the tax man, and things like that. But FinTech is attacking all of those things, right? It's more transparent. It's, uh, you know, you can track it. 
Yes, there are, there's, a, there's an issue of privacy involved, but if you move into the space of crypto assets, then maybe you can select the level of privacy that you want. You want a lot of privacy, you pay for that. Mm -hmm. You don't want the privacy, it's for free, or maybe someone else will be paying you, you know, if you provide the data. So what uh, Facebook uh, is announcing, and I really want to come back to that point, um, the impact. One of the evaluations, the best one I saw, was that this is going to kill fintech. Mm -hmm. Because, Dominicus, you know, if movement of money across the world is uh, free and you know, as sending text messages, um, what, what, what type of uh, value propositions do fintech companies will bring? That's a good question. But, just not to be very de de depressed on that, is uh, it's not that easy. You know, payments, cross-border payments have been around as much as, you know, the society has been around. You know, Hawala system is very efficient. You know, you just call the guy on the other side of, of the Red Sea, right, and he pays out the money. Super efficient, super cheap. You know, why do we need fintech companies? It's all about other things that come with that, you know, what kind of economy do you want to sustain, right? Online integration, point of sale. Is Facebook gonna be at the point of sale or just online? Not everything is online. So I think it remains to be seen. <clears throat> I think this is a you know, really exciting time to, to be thinking about all of these opportunities that are, that are in front of us. As you said, you know, it's not as if this, this has come as a complete surprise, but now it's here. I think again, the, uh, the, the cogs are turning in our brains and thinking, okay, what's gonna happen next? How could it affect us? Could it be you know, enormously uh, disruptive and, uh, and how do we go from there? Super. So, let's uh, let's let's sort of start to start to wrap up. We're we're getting getting towards the end of the uh, the, the session, and and I think again, if we if we think about our, our viewers in the U.S. especially here, uh, what kind of recommendations can we give to them when they're thinking about scaling their businesses in in Europe? Sure. So I think the the first recommendation is, and what we recommend for the clients is that first try the market using the partnership model. Don't go directly, jump into the market, you know, get the license. That's not the way that we recommend to do it. We, we tend to recommend to, to try it through the partnerships, onboard some clients, see how you feel, see, understand the market, how it works, and then move from the business model into more uh, established uh, presence in Europe. I think that's, that's one, of, one of the keys. If you're choosing then from 28 countries where you want to be established, each and country has, has their own value proposition. So I think you have to look into each and, and uh, all of them. And uh, of course, let us know. We're happy to provide information of what kind of value we can bring to, to your business. Super, nice, nice clear message there, thank you. And again, from a regulatory perspective, I would, I would say do not overestimate, underestimate uh, the differences uh, in regulatory space. Just a very simple one, you know, on data privacy. Europe has a really big stance yeah. on that. And sometimes the business model that you are used to, you know, it makes sense to you. If you want to just replicate it in, in Europe and scale it, sometimes you have to tweak that. And, you know, we value privacy in Europe and uh, maybe you'll have to adapt. Super, super, thank you. Good, uh, good, good final uh, message there as well. So this, this sort of brings us to, uh, to the end of our uh, live Q&A webinar. Thanks for the, uh, the questions that came in before and, uh, and during the session. Um, I think it's been great to have uh, two of Lithuania's top thought leaders here with us uh, in, the, in the studio and, uh, and sharing your thoughts. So, so thank you very much to you both. Uh, again, uh, I think this is, uh, it's really inspiring and encouraging to see what, uh, uh, what's coming next and what's already been done. This is, this is fantastic. Um, so you've uh, heard a lot about the, the Lithuanian uh, fintech ecosystem. Uh, we have contacts um, for you to, to follow up with any additional questions. And uh, I guess we'd be always happy to, uh, to uh, um, you know, field any questions that uh, or, in, or inquiries that people have uh, based on uh, on this today as well. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you to our viewers. Good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.